I will exalt you, my God, the King. I will praise your name forever and ever. Every day I will praise you and extol your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. Thank you, Jesus, for your word this morning. And we worship you, Lord. Now sing this song with us. I'm gonna sing to 
Till my heart starts changing Oh, I'm gonna worship Till I mean every word Cause the way I feel And the fear I'm facing Doesn't change who you are Or what you deserve I give you my worship You still deserve it Pour out your praises In blessing and break it You're worthy, you're worthy You're worthy of my soul Yes, you are, Jesus Lord, you're still worthy yeah. I'm gonna live Like my King is risen Gonna preach to my soul That you've already won And even though I can't see it I'm gonna keep believing That every promise you Stop singing your praise And in the blessing and the pain You are worthy Whether you say yes or no away You are worthy Come on And through it all I choose to say You are worthy Lord, I'll never stop singing your praise Oh, I'll never stop singing your praise Yes, you are, Jesus. 
Lord, you're still worthy. You're still worthy of my praise, Jesus. No matter the circumstance, oh, you're still worthy. And I'll never stop singing your praise. Come on, give him praise this morning. Sing out your praise to him. He is worthy. Thank you, Father. Thank you that you don't change, Jesus. You're still worthy of our praise. In the valley or on the mountain, you're still worthy, Jesus. I'll never stop singing your praise. chorus that would just sing your word, just the voices. Particularly to the high school students, the young adults, or maybe you are um, exploring who Christ is. Uh, maybe you're in a season of uh, disillusionment. Um, in case if you haven't figured it out yet, life rarely works the way you thought it would work. And so what can happen is we can attach an outcome to God's worthiness or faithfulness and so we'll say well well lord you're you're faithful um but then i had a miscarriage which my wife and i experienced miscarriage so does that mean god's not faithful um you go well i didn't get the job so you must not be faithful or this person passed away you must not be faithful or, i'm going through this hard time this not, must not be faithful or you've prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed and it did not happen and you're going well god are you worthy of it all so i want us to root ourselves firmly in who god is our feelings and our emotions are not god god is god independent of our feelings and our emotions. So this is why understanding theology is so important. So just follow me here. If the God of the Bible who reveals himself as Yahweh, the great I am, is number one, eternal. So that means that past, present, and future are right now to him. He's never caught off guard. If he's omniscient, that means he's all-knowing. That means not only does he know what would happen, but what could happen. We're playing chess, he's playing eternal checkers. Not only is he eternal, all-knowing, he's also all-loving. He's all-powerful. So if those things are true and what you prayed for doesn't come to be, then it must be in your best interest that he didn't allow it to be so. What if he's actually stripping things out of your life because you're putting them ahead of him? 
What if the very things you're praying for and the things you wanted to work out, he's going, that's not the exit I want you to take. The bridge is broken there, uh, metaphorically. So what I'm saying is, he's worthy of it all because of this. The cross is still bloody and the tomb is still empty and he's worthy of it all. So this is what we're gonna do is we're gonna sing that, you know, you know the part like we did at the nine, you remember that part? If you don't, just pretend like you do. <laughs> we're gonna sing that again, but this is going to be our prayer. Because friends, in my old world, in the sports world, so if you win a game, it's like, oh, praise God, God is good. But if you lose, I don't wanna talk. Is God really good then if the only time you can praise him is if something good happens? No, he's worthy of praise because I should have been on the cross. He's worthy of praise because I should have been in the tomb. He's worthy of praise because he's the Lord God Almighty. He is the King of Kings. He is the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end. He is worthy of praise. Let him know that he's good. Shout to the rooftops. I sat by that hospital bed You were worthy And she couldn't barely lift her head You were worthy And after all those tears were shed You were worthy I'll never stop singing your praise Oh, I'll never stop singing your praise Oh, and in the Thank you, Lord Jesus. Come, Holy Spirit, in power and glory, reveal the heart of this Father's heart to us. In your name we pray, and God's people said, amen, amen, and amen. Can we give it up to our music team for leading us to the throne of grace and mercy? All right. Well, wonderful. So good. Y'all still standing. I love it. She's like, I ain't done. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. It's amazing. People will make fools of themselves at a football game for players who won't even sign your autograph, and Jesus has your name tattooed in the palm of his hand. Oh, let me stop. Let me stop. It ain't the preaching part yet. I got to do the introduction. Hey, let's take a moment and welcome our guests who are tuning in online, who are physically here. Thank you so much. Let's give it up for our guests. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Also, uh, because of your missionary hearts and your desire to see people know Jesus, through our Easter weekend, we had 18,000 people in person and online hear the gospel. We want to reach the world. Now, for some of you, if you're new here, you're going, well, why are you talking about numbers? Here's a question. On the day of Pentecost, 3,000 people got saved. Who was counting? One, two, it's 3,000, Peter, it's 3,000. You know why we count? Because every person counts. We count because every person counts. That's why Jesus went to the cross to count the cost of redeeming and rescuing us with his love. And so we celebrate. There's 8 billion people on the planet, and I want all 8 billion to know King Jesus, and we want to do our part. 
Let's give it up for the mighty men and beautiful women of all of our correctional facility partnerships. Now, keep this in mind. When we say that, it's no longer just Kershaw and in the Carolinas. It's 400 correctional facilities in 40 states. One day, we're going to say it's in every state in these United States of America. So welcome, welcome, welcome. And TC family, it is so good to see you guys. We're kicking off a brand new series called Grow By. And so we're going to learn how to spiritually mature. We're going to learn how to spiritually grow. There are terms for that. One is discipleship, which means we're an apprentice or a student. And the word spiritual formation is used interchangeably. The Holy Spirit is forming us into the image of Christ. But before we do, I want to share a frustration with you that I have. So y'all know I love to fish, right? By the way, it's very biblical to fish because all of Jesus's closest disciples were fishermen. And when Jesus rose from the dead, what was he doing? At the Sea of Galilee, he was grilling some fish. Hence, he loves fishermen. If you don't fish, I question... No, I'm just kidding. I'm just joking. So anyway, anyway, so I bought a new scale because I love to catch fish and I like to weigh them and put them on the internets. And my wife is like, honey, um, it's the same picture. And I'm like, but it's a different fish. It's like the same picture, and I'm looking the same way. Anyway, so I got a new digital scale. I tried to upgrade. So I'm fishing, boom, I throw out my little swim bait. It's in the water, like my swim bait be like, come and get, I mean, my swim baits are great. They be pop locking on the fish, the fish can't resist it. Anyway, boom, I catch me a little bass. I bring it up, I pull out my new digital scale, and it's not working. So I'm, I'm working, I'm pressing on, on, on. It's not working. And I'm like, I can't let the little fish die. So I threw the fish back in the water. I'll catch it next week. And, and so I'm looking at the scale. I'm like, I didn't spend $27.99 on this Amazon and it don't even work. And I grab the scale and I turn it over and there's some red tape in the back where the battery is. And I'm like, this thing don't even work. And I just pulled the tape out and literally I turn the scale over and it goes, hi. <laughs> All I had to do was pull out the red tape and it turned on. I wonder if our lives are kind of like that scale is we're working hard, we're getting families, we're doing our thing, we got bank accounts and we're working hard. It's like something is just not working and God is going by faith. You got to pull the red blood off that cross and let it bring you alive. And so what we want to do is learn how to live a life of spiritual formation alive through the blood of King Jesus. But we got a problem, though. But sin is not our problem. Let's pause here. Depending upon the background you come from, if you're a church person, if you're an unchurched person, like, well, what exactly is sin? So, so let's look at the historical biblical understanding. The word sin simply means to miss the mark. Well, what is the mark? Jesus himself is the second person of the eternal triune God, Yahweh, the great I am, Jehovah. So when Jesus becomes a human being, not only is he our sinless sacrifice and lamb of God, but he's also the living portrait of what humans were meant to be. Okay, come here, come, come here, come here. Ladies, can you imagine marrying a man who had the character of Jesus? Can you imagine the way he could love you? Can you imagine his patience and his gentleness and and his wisdom and his grace and his sacrificial strength. Men, can you imagine marrying a woman who had the character of Jesus? Can you imagine working In corporate America where people aren't stabbing you in the back to get the corner office, to get the highest raise, but everybody's there going, how can I serve you? How can I make your life better? Can you imagine just 10,000 people living with the character and the beauty of Jesus? 
Well, we don't have to imagine it. We actually can experience it because that is God's goal. God's goal is not simply to send us to heaven, quote unquote, when we die. It's to bring the heavenly character of Jesus to us on earth while we die. Live. Now, let me say something to the mamas and daddies. Listen, you can have a big old house, you can have a nice car, you can pay for stuff, but if your character in your home does not reflect Christ, it is going to damage your children. This is serious. Your spiritual formation is serious. Listen, li- listen, there's a good chance your child is not going to be the next LeBron James or Serena or Cam Newton, or whoever else. Let them know that it is a priority that your spiritual formation, that your love life with Jesus is of supreme importance because you've beheld his goodness and he holds you in his nail-pierced hands. But our problem, though, y'all, is not sin. It is a symptom of our problem. Idolatry is our problem problem. It's a word we don't use very often. It's a deeply biblical word, but we're going to explain it. So check this out. An idol is anyone or anything from which we derive ultimate love, identity, value, and purpose. An idol is anyone or anything from which we derive ultimate love, identity, value, and purpose. For example, Having children are a gift and it's wonderful, but let me challenge and lovingly say this for some of you moms, you idol your children. They have been ahead of Jesus and as a result, you parent with this fear and this iron grip and at 18, they are going to run out of that house. Not only are you a helicopter parent, you are a smothering parent. Like you won't even let them go through any trials to grow at all. You're constantly rescuing them. If you constantly rescue them, how are they going to develop spiritual muscles? For some of us, example, for 26 years of my life, football was my idol. It gave me what I thought was love. It gave me identity, significance, purpose. The problem with an idol is, is it's never full. You got to give and give and give. But what happens though when your knee gives out? What happens though when your back gives out? What happens when you are tired of amping yourself up? By nature, I am very docile and gentile. I probably should have been a psychologist. So how do you feel today, my friend? Hmm. For football, I had to find something to get angry about. And after six years, I got tired. The anxiety, the stress. There was a time that I thought the fans loved me. They didn't love me. They were happy if I helped them win their bets. By the way, stop the betting, please. Listen, there's going to be a gambling explosion out of this world. Every time I turn on ESPN, Amazon Prime, they are luring you in. Gambling is a dopamine hit. It will get you high like you are on cocaine. Stop today. If you want to invest your money, invest it in Transformation Church so we can save some people. It's hard for me to watch ESPN. I'm like, I don't want to know about gambling. I don't care where the parlay is. I want to know about the one who laid on the cross so we could live and not die. Hey, exactly, baby. Praise God. (laughs) She's like, hey, man, don't take me out, mama. Don't take me out. He's preaching good. (laughs) Now, here's the thing about idolatry, guys. Check this out. First Corinthians chapter 10, verse 20, Paul is talking to the people at Corinth. Now, Corinth was a major city in the, in the Roman Empire. It had people coming to faith, Gentiles from pagan backgrounds. So they worshiped everything. So how many of you know that when you become a Christian, you automatically don't stop bad habits? 
And so what they were doing is what's called syncretism. They were taking their paganism and bringing it into the church. And Paul's like, no, no, you don't want to do that. You are messing with serious stuff. And he says this, no, not at all. I'm saying that these sacrifices are offered to demons, not to God. And I don't want you to participate with demons. And so when we have idolatry, even of good things, that is demonic influence because what demons want to do is even take our eyes off of Jesus by doing good things. There's a difference between a good thing and a God thing. A good thing is what you do. A God thing is what God invites you into. So here's what we do here at Transformation Church is we have a pathway of discipleship. We have a disciple-making culture. What I want everybody to do, and you should have some handouts, go to transformationchurch.tc, go to next steps, click disciple-making culture, and you're going to see first steps, next steps, life steps. We want you engaged and involved, and we want all of us to mature and grow. And the way we mature and grow is not by trying, it's by dying and allowing God to live in us more deeply, more fully. But when we were planning Transformation Church, uh, Vicki and I said to Pastor Paul, listen, these are the five things that Jesus' disciples did, and these are the five things we're going to do at Transformation Church. Number one is all of life is worship, right? All of life is a response to God's grace. There's nothing we do that's not worship except for sin. So we connect in small groups for the word and prayer and encouragement. We give generously for where your heart is, your treasure will be there also. We live a servant life like, like, like we serve. And let me pause here, and this isn't any shade, but for Easter, my wife, who lifts heavy here at this church, you don't see a lot of things she do in the background, she had to serve in the kids because we didn't have enough servant leaders. And I'm like, well, of course she's going to, I mean, she's awesome, but she shouldn't have to when she's got other things to do. And a baby peed on her. And every, everybody laughed, and I'm like, well, of course, she's a servant leader, but that's what she's going to do. But I'm like, why is she doing that? We got thousands of people. Like, this can only happen if all of us, she has her hands full. Now, that's the kind of woman she is. She's a servant leader, but that shouldn't be something that she has to do because there's not enough people to be able to do it. So it takes all of us. And so a community of servant leaders, but then living a life of invitation as a missionary. So we're going to shape our lives this way. And this isn't something that is just theory. It's something that we lived even before we planted Transformation Church. And so over the next several weeks, we're going to grow ourselves in this capacity. Why, y'all? Why is it important? Because God wants us to worship him because he wants us to become like Jesus, holy, humble, and happy. Holy, humble, and happy. So, so let's break down these three H's. What does holiness mean? Holiness, number one, means sacred and set apart. The moment that any of us say yes to Jesus as our Savior, he says, I'm taking you out of darkness and I'm putting you into the light. And not only are you in my light, but all of your sin is forgiven and forgotten, past, present, future. I'm gonna purify you. You're as righteous as my son. And that leads to this devotion, this single-hearted devotedness. Humble, what does humble mean? Humble means this. Lord, I need you the way my lungs need oxygen. Um, I've had people say, you know, you Christians use Jesus as a crutch. I'm like, no way, dude. That's not a strong enough analogy. He's my life support system. I need him continuously. Well, that means you're weak. It does. But I'm stronger than I ever thought was possible because Jesus only uses weak people. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And then happy. Okay, I saved that for last because I know I'm going to get some emails from some of you veteran Christians, and this, what, and this is what you're going to say. Well, you know, happiness deals with happenings externally. Joy is on the inside. Guys, I used to say that too until I studied Hebrew and Greek. They mean the same thing. Gladness and happiness means the same thing. 
Happiness does not mean you're walking around smiling all the time. Happiness deals more with your character formation and your rootedness and your purpose in God. Have you ever been around somebody who has a non-anxious spirit about them and they're calm when all hell is breaking loose, when they should be losing their mind, they are steady, they are focused, their emotions don't go up and down like a roller coaster. That That's what happiness is. Happiness deals more with who you are becoming in a world with chaos, you have clarity. In a world that is shaken up, you have stability. You have a joy that celebrates other people's success. I don't know if that did none for y'all, but it sure helped me. (laughs) Check this out. That was like the uh, master's, go- uh, Derwin Gray just hit a 430-yard drive. <laughs> okay, black people, the white people want to clap, help them. Just start clapping, they're waiting, they're like, they're like. <sighs> By the way, if you're new here, we joke about race all the time. If you're sensitive, you're going to struggle. Matter of fact, a part of your teaching is go watch old Archie Bunker episodes, the Jeffersons, and Good Times, and you'll be like, this was on TV? We're so sensitive today. It's comedy. Okay. (laughs) Who snorted? Was that you? That's amazing. Galatians 4.19. Uh, Look what Paul says to a church that literally turned their back on him. He says, my children, I'm again suffering labor pains for you until Christ is formed in you. Interesting. Notice what it doesn't say. My children, I'm in labor pain so that all your dreams come true. My children, I'm in labor pain so your mortgage gets paid. And God like, well, I didn't tell you to buy that big old house you couldn't afford. I didn't tell you to buy that car you couldn't afford trying to impress people who are too stressed out to pay attention to you. Now he says, I'm again suffering labor pains for you until Christ is formed in you. Character formation, the spirit of God, that's what he wants to do in us. This is why Transformation Church exists. But what prevents us from loving God completely for those of us who follow Christ and those of us who are exploring Christ is the power of darkness deforms us with lies. On the count of three, say lies. One, two, three, lies. The only thing the dark powers can do, family, is get you and I to believe lies. The scene of the crime is your lies. That's his only tool, is to get you to believe lies. As a matter of fact, one of the lies of our culture in 2024 is you're not lost. No, no, you're your own person. You're, you're a free thinker. Matter of fact, if you spend a time now, teenagers and young adults, hear my heart here, okay? Hear my heart. TikTok, IG, there are people on there trying to indoctrinate you. And they're going, no, be a free thinker like us. The moment you're born, you're getting ideas from someone else. Here comes a big word. It's a Latin word. It's a philosophical word. Tabula rasa. No one is tabula rasa, meaning clean slate. As soon as you're born, you're learning language. You're learning ideas. You're learning customs. There is nothing new under the sun. We live in a culture now where it says this, your happiness and your desires being met is your highest good and goal. Guys, that's Epicureanism. That's 307 BC, Greek philosopher, Epicurus. You're not a free thinker. That's 2,600 years old. Selfishness and getting what's yours in place of everybody else and your happiness, that's not a new philosophy. That's old. Now, friends, the question is this. Are we receiving information from someone who has our best interests in mind, who wants what's best for us? Here's another lie. You're capable of fixing yourself. 
So I'm going to spend the next six months really drilling down on this. Um, I think the Holy Spirit has led me to something in our culture that's really important in this. Um, Self-help books, books to fix yourself, have exploded since 2004. It's one of the fastest growing genres. If we don't have a sin problem, why do we spend so much time trying to fix ourselves? That's the definition of sin. We missed the mark. How do we get back on the mark? So what a lot of people do is they do an ancient philosophy called stoicism. I'm going to control my thoughts. I'm going to control my actions. I'm going to control my behaviors. I'm going to will myself to be this emotionalist creature, and thus I have strength. Guys, that was 300 BC. That's 2,600 years old as well. There's no free thinkers all knowledge, there's nothing new under the sun. And here's the problem with trying to fix yourself. It either leads to ego, edging God out, look how great I am, I don't need God. Or self-loathing, look how bad I am. God can never love me. Notice where both of the focus is on, me. Okay, there's gonna be some strong medicine here. Some of us are miserable because we keep just looking at ourselves. Take your eyes off yourself. You're not the only one who's suffering. You're not the only one who's had bad breaks. This world is not yet the new heavens and new earth. But God is good even in the midst of it. And he doesn't ask you to fix yourself. He wants to do it. And then lastly... Another lie of the enemy is you're not selfish. By the way, if someone goes, you're selfish, and you go, I'm not selfish. You don't say you're not selfish. That's what other people say about you. Does that make sense? If you say, well, I'm not selfish, you probably are. That's what other people say about you. And these are three lies that the enemy wants to do on us. But we can love God completely because of the Spirit of God. Jesus transforms us with his gospel truth. The scene of the crime is your Why do we love him completely? Because you and I, when I say you, I'm talking about me too, because you are lost. Jesus left the 99 sheep to find you. Check this out. This is one of my favorite texts in the Bible, and I'm getting reacquainted with it. Jesus is telling a parable, teenagers, that means a story to explain a spiritual truth. Then Jesus told this parable, suppose one of you has 100 sheep and loses one of them. Let's pause here. That doesn't emotionally connect with us because it's 2024 and you probably don't own sheep, but I know some of you do. So in the ancient Jewish world, to own sheep was a big deal and you would nurture them and you would care for them. That's why one of the metaphors is that Jesus is the great shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lay down in green pastures. He leads me to quiet waters. He renews my soul, right? So, so Jesus is saying, if you've got 99 sheep and one leaves, guess what you do? Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it. You're the lost sheep. Let me pause there. For those of us who follow Jesus, this isn't just introductory into Christ and you move beyond this. No, 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 no. This is what elicits our hearts to praise is we never, ever forget that we were wandering in the wilderness, that there were wolves and danger around, and we heard a voice calling our name and a blood-soaked Savior running after us to get us. For those of us who think we're spiritually mature, I don't care how much the theology and scripture you know. The test of your devotion to Christ is your heart breaks at the mention of his name and to think of the hole that he pulled you out of and that love overwhelms you 
And you are blown away and surprised this morning. I'm grateful not just to be a pastor, not to be a husband, not only to be a father, but I'm grateful that I belong to the great father, that he found me when I wasn't looking for him. And he found you too. Now watch this, watch this. Verse five. And when he finds it, he runs to the sheep and says, you're a dumb sheep. I told you not to leave. What an idiot. Get your sorry butt back home. Some of you think that's what God does because that's the way you were raised. That's the way you were parented. And that's exactly what you do to your kids right now. They make a mistake and you jump down their throats because you haven't drank deeply enough from the grace of God. Do you know what the punishment is, y'all? The fact that they did it. God's judgment goes, go ahead. So the last thing they need from you is more of that. They need a good shepherd that finds them dirty and icky and put them on their shoulders. Now notice this language. He joyfully puts it on his shoulders. Joyfully. Guys, we have a joyful, happy God who's going, I found my sheep and I'm happy. Let me make it really personal. God is happy to save you. Jesus is happy to love you. The Holy Spirit is happy to comfort you. We have a happy God who's looking for his lost sheep. And we stay rooted in that reality that, oh my God, I should have been ate by wolves if not for the shepherd. Check this out. And he goes home. Then he calls all his homies and homets together and says, rejoice with me, I found my lost sheep. Now he got 99 more, but that one, he's happy. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. I want you to take a look at this. This is art by a gentleman named Kevin Cardine. And, and look at this, this is you and me. I mean, we just, I mean, we're not very smart. <laughs> We just, we just stuck in mud. For some of you, your mud is addiction. For some of you, you're stuck in the pain of the past. For some of you, who knows what it is for us, but I do know this, there is one that is coming and hell won't stop him. Death won't stop him. Demons can't stop him. Nothing can stop him. And notice, he doesn't say, now before I pick you up, I want you to clean yourself up. No, no, no. He picks you up and he cleans you with his blood. This is why we love him completely. Next, Jesus transforms us with his gospel truth because you and I are broken beyond repair. Jesus makes us into a new creation. Check this out. This is Ephesians chapter 4, 20 through 24. Paul is talking to the multi-ethnic churches in modern day Turkey, which is Ephesus. But this is not how you came to know Christ. Notice the language, not know about Christ, but actually know Christ. Assuming you heard about him and were taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, to take off your former way of life, the old self that is corrupted by deceitful desire. So all of us are born in Adam. We are broken to the core. That's why we have like character formation in school. That's why we're trying to improve because we're broken. To be renewed in the spirit of your mind and to put on the new self, the one created according to God's likeness and righteousness and purity of the truth. In order for you and I to be in covenant relationship with God, we have to be pure. That is Jewish temple language for no sin or defect. None of us qualify, so Jesus qualifies us. Righteousness means that we followed God's 10 commandments. None of us done it, so Jesus did it for us. And then the new self is God goes, when you believe in me, I I see you as though you live the Ten Commandments perfectly. I see you as pure and sacred and holy. Not only you're forgiven, but you are new in the deepest part of you. Pause. Okay, I'm risking an illustration here. I hope it works. If not, forgive me. I'm wearing clothes. It would be very odd if I came up here without any. It ain't that kind of church. 
the clothes that I am wearing are not me. They are covering me. So when you and I are born again, at our deepest core, we are alive in God, but we're housed in what the Bible calls flesh, not skin. Flesh is our old patterns of doing things. So let me help you out really quickly. This helped me out. You're never going to get to a point where you go, man, why, did I not, why am I still thinking that? It's because we got these old clothes on. So the issue isn't we get rid of the old clothes. We learn how not to let them dictate to us. Because at the deepest part of me, I am new. So watch this. So there are times where I will just have a crazy thought like, just sock him in the jaw. I'm like, why am I going to sock the man in the jaw? I'm like, so when I have those crazy thoughts that are anti-God and God's will, I tell myself, wait a minute, that's the old self. That's not me. So I begin to praise. I begin to thank God for who I am. So, so this is what happens to us. Now, if you're under 25, there used to be these things called tapes. And there was a tape recorder. For many of us, we play the same tape recorder over and over. I'm damaged. I'm worthless. I'm no good. Jesus is telling you today to throw the tape away, and he wants to give you a digital download of who you are. And he says this, in your new self, you are pure. In your new self, you are righteous. In your new self, you're in my image. So when I have those thoughts, the goal isn't to argue with those thoughts. The goal is to go, man, I ain't got time for you. I'm going to get back to worship. Seriously. Y'all, that will change your life. What most Christians are taught to do is go, okay, come on, sin, let's go, let's go. Let's, and then before you know, you're like, I done done it again. Because you're focusing on something that is not you. Focus on the new you in Christ. We're going to talk more about that. So, so maybe this illustration will help. Alex Acevedo on our comm team made this, right? And, and so this is what's called a mosaic, right? And what is a mosaic? A mosaic is fractured pieces that have been regathered and put together to make something beautiful. Well, you know what God does with us is he takes are fractured pieces. You know, even the abused pieces, even the my parents left me pieces, even the neglect pieces. And he takes his nail-pierced hands and his blood is the supernatural glue that creates something so beautiful that the cracked, fractured pieces begin to testify to his grace. Can I testify for a moment? I'm feeling grateful today. To grow up as a compulsive stutterer up until I was 26 years old, the amount of pain, you know, back then they didn't call it bullying. My grandmother said, toughen up. That was it. One of, one of the reasons why I didn't do well in school is because I didn't ask questions. Why would I raise my hand to ask questions as a compulsive stutterer and just get blasted? Even before I get on stage, I still hear the laughing. I still hear the voices. I still hear it. But isn't it beautiful that Jesus can take a place of pain and turn it into something beautiful. Isn't it beautiful that Jesus can take a garbage dump and turn it into a garden of grace? Isn't it beautiful that the boy who stuttered has spoken in universities in Oslo, Norway, Berlin, Germany, Calcutta, India, Indian land, South Carolina, In God's hand, the new self can take those broken pieces and your brokenness becomes your blessing. That's the kind of God we serve. (laughs) 
Jesus transforms us with his gospel truth because you and I are selfish, so Jesus' sacrifice shows us how to be genuinely human. So salvation is the restoration of our genuine humanity. Here comes another philosophy word, okay? Feeling philosophical today. We're not Platonist. Plato taught on earth and in heaven there are forms that match. And your flesh is bad. No, 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 no. God is going to renew all of creation and we're going to have resurrected glorified bodies here on earth. The body is good. Creation is good. And God wants to restore that through his supernatural life. But how does he do it? Philippians 2, 3, don't be selfish. Try not to impress others. Woo, boy, that'll save you a lot of trouble. Teenagers, that'll save you from running from cops at night. At night. Not that I got any experience about that. <laughs> not like yesterday, like teenagers. <laughs> that was Vicky yesterday. Um, <laughs> Vicky's in the Crenshaw Mafia. Okay, Uh, be humble, thinking of others as better than yourselves. Do not look out only for your own interest, but take an interest in others too. You must have the same attitude that is in Christ, that Christ Jesus had. Now, pause here. These next verses I'm going to read is one of the earliest songs that was sang in the early church. And I want you to notice how God-centered this song is. This is why we're writing our own songs here at Transformation Church. We're going to have more coming out. So watch this. This, is, this, this. this was a song. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges... He took the human position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on the cross. And so this is what the Lord wants to do. We worship him completely because we were created to be sacrificial, servant-hearted people. You ready? We were not created to be takers. We were created to be givers. Can you imagine? I don't know who this is for, but some of you young teenagers right now, one day you're going to be CEOs of billion dollar companies and you're going to shock the world because you're going to go, you know what? I've made several hundred million uh, the last few years and I'm not going to take a salary. You know what I'm going to do? For every employee that makes under $100,000, I'm going to pay for all their kids to go to college. You know, you, you, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to make sustainable housing for the homeless also with mental health treatment facilities. By the way, let me check some of y'all real quick. 40, nearly 50% of all homeless people have mental illness problems. They're not on the street just because they didn't work hard like you. And since I'm here, and since I'm here, some of you with that type of money one day, you know what you're going to do? Instead of complaining that health care is a ripoff, you're going to make your own free health care. It's amazing. My friends from Europe come over. They go to the doctor and go, man, these people took all our money. I'm like, welcome to America. We're not just going to complain about the problems, be the solution to the problem. That's why we're here. We are here to bring heaven to earth. If you think God's goal is simply to get you out of problems, no, it is to transform us so we can be the solution to the problems. Okay. I'm getting tired. Romans 12, 1 and 2, this is why we're named Transformation Church. Therefore, brothers and sisters, in view of the mercies of God, notice mercy comes before obedience. In view of the mercies of God, I urge you to present your bodies as living sacrifice. That's all of life is worship, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true worship. Do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern What is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God? Our worship team is going to, our music team is going to come out. This song is a part of 
the sermon. And after they do, I'm going to lead us in prayer. We're going to continue with our service.
that have been saying, the gospel that has been preached would burrow deep into our souls and root us and establish us in the great love of Christ Jesus. That we would be a people liberated by the gospel truth. That we would live in the fact that he left the 99 to rescue us. That we have a, a new self. And that the selfless Christ is in us. May we love you more than anything because you first loved us. We rebuke the lies of the devil. We rebuke the pain and hurt of the past. And we receive resurrection power today. We will grow by loving you completely because of the love that came to us. Right now in this moment, I believe that there are many saying, hey, pastor, I'm ready to follow Jesus, not just know about him, but I'm ready to follow him. If you've never surrendered your life to King Jesus, he's calling your name. He says, you don't have to clean yourself up, little lamb. My blood will clean you up. You don't have to try to impress me, little lamb. My love will be oppressed upon you. Come as you are. Come as you are. Come to the love you've been created for. The Bible says that if we confess with our mouth and believe in, my, in our hearts that Jesus died on the cross and rose again to forgive our sins, he rescues us from darkness to light, from death to life, from unforgiveness to forgiveness. Would you receive the greatest gift of all today? If that describes you right now in this moment, just say this to him in the silence of your heart. Today, King Jesus, I'm not going to run anymore. I'm turning towards you. I'm covered in filth and dirt. Would you please cover me in your love and blood? By faith, I believe that on that bloody cross you bled for my sins. I believe your blood forgives me. I believe your blood makes me pure. I believe your blood makes me righteous. I believe your blood forever tattoos me with your loving kindness. And I believe that on the third day you rose again to give me a new life and a new power. And I choose to follow you, King Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen, amen, and amen. Let's give God a round of applause. Amen. Amen. Okay, you may be seated. For those of you new to the faith, amen just means I agree. So when you walked out, uh, my hospitality team gave you some information where you can get connected, right? You can fill out your little sermon notes and everything. Also, if you prayed to receive Christ with me or renewed your faith in Christ, I want you to fill out this connection card and on the back it says, today I received Christ as my savior. Today I recommitted my life to Christ. I wanna get baptized. Would you please check those that indicate you so we can know how to best serve you, okay? If you've not been baptized, we want you to be baptized. Baptism is like this wedding ring. It shows the world that I belong to Vicki. When you're baptized, it shows the world you belong to Jesus. It is a key step in your faith journey, okay? So what's our soul tattoo? Here it is, love God completely. So throughout the week, Listen to the sermon over and over. Before I preach this message to you, I've preached it to myself seven times. So don't let me have all the fun. Catch up with me. Listen to it on the way to work when you're working out. Work through the study guide. Save these all year long and you'll have a systematic theology to study the whole entire year. Share the messages with, with friends. Well, what's our action step? Our action step is this. I want you to meditate and pray Ephesians 3, 16 through 19, three times a day, morning, noon, night. So as soon as you wake up, go to Ephesians 3, 16 through 19 at lunchtime and then at night. Imagine the thousands upon thousands of us praying this prayer together. Imagine the power that will be unleashed in us and through us. Well, what does it say? It's one of my favorite prayers in the Bible. It says this, and I pray that he may grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strength with power in your inner being through his spirit. 
and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, I pray that you being rooted and firmly established in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the length and width, height and depth of God's love and to know Christ's love that surpasses knowledge. So that, so that, so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Would you receive it? Let's pray this collectively throughout this week so that we can grow by worshiping God completely. Can y'all welcome Christelle Avacado to the stage? Avacado! So this has been an incredible time together. Pastor Derwin's message is so timely. And he mentioned during his message about our disciple making culture. And this is something that each of us gets to participate in. It's not just Pastor Derwin's job or, or the staff's job, but it's all of us participating in it together to create this culture of people who, who are growing together growing together in Christ. And so throughout this series, you're gonna learn about the five characteristics of a disciple, worship, which we talked about today, connect, serve, give, and invite. And each week you'll be able to go to the next steps area in the lobby where you can learn about how you can grow in each of these characteristics, how you can connect, how you can serve, how you can give, how you can invite people into this disciple making culture at Transformation Church. So make sure that you do that um, we need each of you to participate in it so that we can continue to grow. Also, I wanted to say thank you to our first time guests. We are so glad that you joined us today at the start of this incredible sermon series. If you take that connection card that Pastor Norman referred to earlier to the Next Steps area, you will receive a copy of his book, The Good Life. It's an incredible resource that can tell you about the kind of happiness that is available to us in Christ. And you can ask questions, get to know some of our teammates over there. And for those of us, or those of you who are watching online, we haven't forgotten about you. You can go ahead and scan the QR code and our team will be in touch with you as well. All right, family, we have worshiped through so many different ways. We've worshiped through, through music, we've worshiped through the preaching and the teaching of God's word. Now we get to worship through generosity. And the reason that we get to be generous is because God has been so generous with us. And so our generosity is simply an overflow of his generosity. So if you would like to participate in giving, you can do so many different ways, whether you wanna do it through the app, online, or drop an envelope in one of our generosity boxes on your way out. Let's take a moment right now to thank God for his generosity. God, thank you so much that you are a good father and you give good gifts. And the greatest gift that you have given us is your son, Jesus, because in Jesus, we receive new life, a life of abundance, a life of fullness, Lord. God, help us to be a reflection of your generosity in our families, in our workplaces, in our communities, Lord so that more people can encounter your love and your generosity. We pray all of this in Jesus' name, amen. All right, friends, now it's time for our benediction. So why don't you stand up with us, with me? Our benediction is how we end every service because it's a reminder of our vision. It's a reminder of who God is and who we are in Him. And so we point upward to love God completely. We point inward to love ourselves correctly. And we point outward to love our neighbors compassionately. Then I'm gonna point at you and you're gonna point right back at us. And we're gonna say Transformers roll out because this is just the... And now it's time to play the... All right, here we go. One, two, three. Upward, inward, outward. Transformers roll out. See you next week. <laughs>